So as I said, this is a very important topic because uh, most diabetics would undergo regular investigations and screening for number of uh, diseases, but often liver is ignored as uh, seen in practice. The flow of my talk will be first, I'll briefly discuss about the cl clinical scenario and epidemiology, then association of NAFLD and diabetes. What is NAFLD? What is its natural history? What could be the screening tools? And is efficient screening tool? And what are the current recommendations by various societies? I'm getting some disturbance. Back, back end team, please mute everyone. Ex except sir. Yeah. So if you look at the epidemiology, the global prevalence of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease amongst diabetic patients is nearly 55%. And if you see here, uh, we uh, in India are about 57.9. Uh, the maximum prevalence is in Europe, which is about 68%. And the uh, lowest is in Africa for uh, well-known reasons, it's about 30%. I'll start with two cases, two index cases. This was a 60-year-old female who came to me. Uh, she's a diabetic for 20 years. She was on regular follow-up with a physician and she presented with hematemesis. When we evaluated her, she had large esophageal varices on endoscopy and we did the endoscopic variceal ligation. Her hemoglobin was 7.5, platelets were low. Uh, the bilirubin OTPT were normal. The only finding on LFT was a reversal of AG ratio. Ultrasound showed coarse ecotexture of liver and mild ascites. We did a fibroscan which showed high E score uh, of 32 kPa, which is suggestive of cirrhosis. Another case, a 72-year-old male who was a diabetic for 25 years, developed some loss of appetite and dyspepsia for one month. And when he was evaluated by an ultrasound, it showed a large liver lesion of 10 into 7 centimeters. When we did a triple phase CT abdomen, it showed that it was hepatocellular carcinoma. He was hepatitis B and C negative. So are these both complications of diabetes mellitus? A very big yes. These are the complications of diabetes mellitus. They can develop fatty liver and cirrhosis, and they can develop hepatocellular carcinoma. Second question, could these have been prevented? Yes, to a large extent, if you diagnose fatty liver in time, uh, when fibrosis is setting in, there are ways to uh, halt it if not reverse it. So let us see uh, the uh, incidence of liver disease in diabetics. So how common are they? The prevalence of NA, NAFLD and NASH in patients with diabetes is over 60%. Patients with NAFLD have two to three-fold risk of development of diabetes. The reverse is also true. Patients with diabetes mellitus have a higher prevalence of steatohepatitis, cirrhosis, and stage liver disease and HCC. Presence of diabetes and IGT uh, seems to accelerate the course of NAFLD and is a predictor of advanced fibrosis and mortality. As age increases, so does the prevalence of NAFLD. Interestingly, type 1 diabetes mellitus do not have NAFLD unless they are obese. So they also develop NAFLD only when they become uh, metabolically inaccurate. So what is NAFLD? It is defined as a condition in which 5 to 10% of hepatocytes exhibit macroscopic steatosis by light macroscopy in the absence of other etiologies of liver disease. NAFLD predisposes to diabetes, cardiovascular disease, NASH, cirrhosis, and SCC. And there is a huge need of liver transplantation in this patient. In fact, this is the commonest cause of liver transplantation across the globe now. In a recent meta-analysis, the global prevalence was estimated to be 25% of NAFLD. So imagine about one-fourth of the world's population is affected by NAFLD. NAFLD and metabolic syndrome share common pathophysiology. That is why they frequently coexist. Uh, once we say that uh, diagnosis of NAFLD, it requires exclusion of both secondary causes of uh, fatty liver and daily alcohol consumption of more than 30 grams of men and more than 20 grams of women are excluded. So there are various causes of macrovesicular and macrovascular uh, steatosis. Alcohol causes macrovesicular steatosis and a variety of drugs like Velprovit, etc., they cause microvascular steatosis. All the pregnancy-related causes, they also lead to microvascular steatosis. Now, NAFLD includes two pathologically distinct conditions with different prognosis. 
one is non alcoholic fatty liver the other is of course non alcoholic steato hepatitis we'll come to that so nafld is a broader term it encompasses all the conditions nafl and nash and nash related cirrhosis so nafld is excessive hepatic fat accumulation steato hepatitis more than 5% of hepatocytes and exclusion of secondary causes and alcoholic fatty liver disease if you look at the histopathology nafl is pure steatosis and mild lobular inflammation may be there but in nash you have ballooning degeneration and severe uh, inflammation and early fibrosis now nash could again be classified into those with early fibrosis and those with um, uh, more than uh, early fibrosis those are f2 or f3 fibrosis and these two both can gradually lead to cirrhosis that means f4 fibrosis nash patients can directly develop hcc even without developing cirrhosis so that's important to understand that our second index patient had hcc without developing cirrhosis another interesting thing is could there be different types of nash yes one type is based on metabolic insult like we see in all diabetics and all those with metabolic uh, syndrome the other type is actually genetically predetermined injury in which pn pla3 variant is there and number of other uh, mutations they cause more prominent injury and inflammation of the liver and higher risk of progression to cirrhosis or hepatocellular carcinoma this is the mechanism for development of cirrhosis in lean nash patients again because they are genetically predetermined for progression so the pro- progress of disease in these patients is faster as far as the pathogenesis is concerned it is believed that it is a Uh, multiple hit model as uh, opposed to previously believed two hit model and numerous studies suggest uh, that nash develops by multiple intra and extracellular events in different cell types such as hepatocytes hepatic hepatic skeletal cells cufer cells and macrophages and there is a what is known as inter organ cross talk between liver and other tissues especially the muscles and adipose tissue and intestines but the key event is insulin resistance and there is emerging evidence that intestinal microbiota and ammonia may be key players in progression so nafld is currently the most important public health problem worldwide in india also there is a huge uh, work going on in nafld and even government is starting several schemes for screening patients at the primary health level so patients with nafld experience elevated rates of cardiovascular events and higher than expected all cause mortality but it's not only liver related mortality since they are a part of metabolic syndrome they actually lead to all the cardiovascular causes of mortality also so liver fibrosis is the strongest predictor of liver related complications and mortality as you can see here as the fibrosis increases the mortality rate in these patients due to liver related cause increases if you see the natural history of nafld about 12 to 40% of fatty liver patients develop nash about to 5 to 10% of them start developing fibrosis and once they develop fibrosis up to 50% of them will develop cirrhosis some of them about 7 to 10% will develop hepatocellular carcinoma and majority of them will need uh, liver transplantation if which if they don't get mortality is sure now another interesting thing is is nafld an appropriate term it is a kind of a negative Um, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease so there was a expert panel consensus in uh, 2020 and uh, it was published in journal of hepatology and they suggested that now we should rather call this mafld that means metabolic dysfunction associated fatty liver disease the only difference would be that now amongst the mafld we would be including even alcoholics who are otherwise uh, fitting into criteria of metabolic syndrome like if they are hypertensive diabetic hyper lipidemias and they are obese and they develop uh, liver disease it may not be always related to alcohol even if they are taking alcohol they would be classified and under mafld so now the principal questions uh, which uh, has been asked that can you should you screen these patients so first let us see uh, what are the various methods by which we can screen these patients for liver fat and fibrosis of course you can do a, a simple ultrasonography you can do a ct scan you can do mri elastography then there are various uh, combination of test and uh, they are put into a formula and you get a score so uh, one of the popular score is a fit for score 
Then you have a non-alcoholic uh, non fatty liver disease fibrosis score. Then fibro test, fibrometer, ELF, fibro scan, and IRFE. So among this, these three which I have marked, ultrasound, MR elastography, and fibro scan are good in the sense that they give you a fat score also. Ultrasonography is uh, more or less arbitrary because they grade fatty liver one, two, three. But MR elastography and fibro scan give you a definite value, which I'll come to and explain it in a better way. Now coming to fibro scan, which is uh, accepted all over the world for estimation of liver fat and fibrosis. This is basically a transient elastography. What is transient elastography? So this is a, a machine known as a fibro scan machine. And uh, it has a transducer. In fact, two transducers come. Less than 70 kg patients are tested with M probe and more than 70 with an Excel probe. So what this transducer does is that it produces a shear wave. And if you put over the right uh, hypochondrium over the liver, the shear wave will uh, pass through the liver and the velocity which, uh, with which it passes through liver tells you how hard is the liver. So that is the simplest uh, way to explain it. And that is uh, beautifully converted into a formula and you get a score which is known as, which is, uh, known as a E-score. Elastography score. So, M probe tests uh, from 2.5 to 6.5 centimeter inside liver and Excel up to 7.5 centimeter inside liver. So, it is a safe and easily performed in 5 to 10 minutes in any clinic or outpatient setting. Patient needs only 2 to 3 hours fast before the procedure. And uh, this must be interpreted with caution in uh, some clinical settings such as congestive uh, cardiac failure in obstructive jaundice, in deep jaundice, in significant transaminitis. So those are the right as you have to be very careful in assessing that. The value may be falsely positive. So when uh, FibroScan came in 2012, it was mainly to assess the liver stiffness or uh, the liver fibrosis. And there were many studies which showed that it showed a good uh, sensitivity uh, to pick up fibrosis. And of course, the specificity of uh, was low. Then uh, the character of cap, that means the control atten attenuation parameter was added to FibroScan machine. Basically, uh, the same probe generates an ultrasound wave and the dampening of ultrasound wave through going through the liver tells you how much fatty the liver is. So when we do a, a FibroScan study in a patient, it uh, allows quantification of decrease of the amplitude of the ultrasonic signals in the liver. And this is how it is done. So firstly, you do uh, M with M or Excel probe, you get ultrasonic signal and you have to check whether good elastogram is coming. If good elastogram is coming, then that means your measurement is valid. And then you get two values like this. Like in this patient, you got a cap value of 216 and a, a, a elastography score of 6.5 kp kilopascals. So anything more than six is suggestive of uh, early fibrosis and any value of more than 225 suggests fatty level. So based on uh, uh, various investigations, the prevalence of NFLDF, as you can see in this uh, chart, that if you do a computer tomography, if you do a liver ultrasound, cap score on fibroscan, NMI, the cap score on uh, fibroscan as the maximum sensitivity to pick up uh, fat in patients who have got any FLD. And if you look at the prevalence of advanced fibrosis uh, as compared to fibro test and NFLD score, the uh, E score on uh, fibros can again scores much better than other modalities. So what are these uh, FIP4 and NAFS score? These are very simplified scoring systems which are available uh, on Google and anybody can uh, do it. And in fact, what you have to do is you have to put few values. Like in FIP4, there are four values. You have to put the age of the patient, AST level, ALT level, and platelet count. And it gives you a value. If the value is less than 1.45, it has a negative predictive value of more than 90% for advanced fibrosis. Then there is a similarly a NFS, NFLD fibrosis score, in which apart from these four uh, parameters, you have to put in patient's BMI and albumin. And it calculates for you what is the 
uh, value of NAFS. So this is a very popular score in the UK, NAFS. And FIF4 is actually now getting popular uh, across the globe. So how do we use these uh, scoring systems? I'll be just coming to that. So the question before this is why to screen? Why to screen your diabetic patients for uh, fat, for uh, assessing their fat status? And why should you know that uh, they, have, they are developing a fatty liver or any FIG? So this uh, was a very nice study in 2016, it was published. This was about 2000 patients were examined and they did with a fibro scan. Uh, about 93% had valid CAP and 98% had valid uh, liver stiffness measurement score. And the study uh, showed that the proportion of patients with increased CAP and LSM was 72% and 17%. That means out of 2,000 patients examined, 72% had increased fat in the liver and about 18% had increased fibrosis in the liver. So this is a huge number. So that only suggests that if you detect these patients in time, and you can take preventive measures. You can perhaps halt the progression of fibrosis. That means they, you may prevent development of cirrhosis and HCC in these patients. Similarly, uh, this was another paper in Journal of Gastroenterology and Hepatology. The data of 557 patients was analyzed and the prevalence of NAFLD in advanced fibrosis based on transient elastography, that means fibroscan was 72% and 21% respectively. Again, so more than 70% patients had fat liver. And this was a wonderful review in hepatology communication in 2021. And authors uh, in detail described that why uh, screening patients with diabetes mellitus is important. And uh, although uh, they have not uh, defined that time, they only say that all those who have uh, been diagnosed as diabetes, you have to evaluate them on these parameters. And they are proposing that the algorithm should involve the first step annual fibrosis score, that means FIP4 score, which is very easy, putting the four values, the OTPT, age, and platelets, followed by vibration control transient elastography. For those who have indeterminate or high score, that means if the FIP score is high, more than 1.3, then you do a fibroscan. So it, it, they have made things even simpler. So patients at low risk, those who are having FIP score of less than 1.3, and uh, fibrous score less than eight can be followed up with the primary care physician with yearly review. While patients who have higher risk, more than 1.3 and more than eight, should be referred to a liver specialized center. So this was a very clear guideline published in 2021. So that those are the reasons that why you should screen these patients. Now the question is whom to screen. Now various societies have recommended differently. The ASLD, that means American Association of Study of Liver, they say that in, in type 2 diabetes, suspect NAFLD and NASH and determine patient's risk of advanced fibrosis by any of these methods. They also recommend the initial blood test and then fibrosis uh, transient elastography. They say that the increasing number of metabolic diseases, increasing risk of progressive liver disease. So you should look for all the metabolic diseases in a particular patient. Then EASL, uh, uh, European uh, Association of Study of Liver, they recommend NAFLD screening in persons at high CVD risk, including type 2 diabetes or metabolic syndrome. Then ADA, American Diabetic Association, recommends NASH and fibrosis screening recommended in persons with type 2 diabetes or pre-diabetes, both uh, with elevated ALT or fatty liver. Our association, that means APASAL, Asia Pacific Association for Study of Liver, it recommends the, they have already incorporated the term MAFLD, you can see here. So they say that the screening of MAFLD by USG should be considered in at-risk populations such as patients with overweight, obesity, and diabetes and metabolic syndrome. So all diabetics should undergo a ultrasonography to assess the fatty liver or fibrosis. Patients with MAFLD should be assessed for other components of metabolic syndrome and be treated accordingly. And patients with MAFLD should receive advice and support for lifestyle intervention to reduce the risk of events from metabolic and cardiovascular disease and to resolve fatty liver disease. So uh, I'm not uh, going into the treatment of uh, NAFLD today in this talk, but uh, all of you have to understand that primary treatment of NAFLD is a lifestyle modification. It was shown very clearly that if a patient, uh, if an obese patient uh, loses about 10% of uh, body weight, 
then his fatty liver score improves tremendously and the, uh, even the early fibrosis has been shown to reverse so it's primarily lifestyle measurement although there are certain drugs also so uh, based on this i think the first line uh, uh, primary management of these patients should be the first thing should be to rule in or rule out advanced fibrosis by doing a fit for or an fld fibrosis score if fit for is less than 1.3 and nfs is less than 1.455 then it is a low risk and this patient should you should advise them lifestyle modification and exercise and no further assessment and repeat evaluation every year but if the fit for is higher than 1.3 then this is probably intermediate to high risk and this patient should be subjected to should be sent to a liver specialist and a lsm that means a transient elastography and liver stiffness measurement should be done by doing a fibro scan and if it is less than 8 then still a low low risk and you can attempt lifestyle modification and exercise more vigorously there is a role of vitamin e pioglitazone and even seroglitazone has been used quite well now in last 4 5 years and has shown good results and you should continue to repeat the evaluation every year but if it, liver stiffness measurement is more than 8 then it is intermediate to high risk then you should consider a liver biopsy or nowadays we generally avoid liver biopsy because fibro scan scores are also quite uh, reliable and based on them you can treat these start treating the patient, these patients and follow them with every 6 monthly fibro scan scores and if you uh, see that the fibrosis score is more than 10 or 12 you should do an endoscopy to rule out esophageal varices and do a triphasic ct scan to rule out hepatocellular carcinoma should you screen for other liver diseases we have been talking about nafld only but yes you should always test hbsag in these patients so all diabetics should uh, get their hepatitis b surface antigen tested and should be vaccinated if they are negative this is a cdc recommendation and especially this is a must for those having diabetic nephropathy because they may have to undergo dialysis and they will be put to additional risk of acquiring hepatitis b and c so they should, we don't have any vaccine for hepatitis c for but for at least hepatitis b they should all be tested and vaccinated in time to prevent this dreadful disease so i think i would summarize by saying that it is very important to screen patients of diabetes mellitus right from outset uh, for development of fatty liver there are good ways to do it there are simple liver test and scoring systems you can do a simple ultrasound to get an idea but if there is a slightest doubt the best test would be to do a fibro scan to assess liver fibrosis and to take their cap score that means control attenuation parameter score for assessing their liver fat and the beauty is that you can do repeated testing it is a non invasive test so you can do it every 6 months or 1 year and then follow these patients how they are doing whether they are doing well on treatment or not thank you so much